Welcome to the first in a series of online interviews with Richard Harvey, psycho-spiritual psychotherapist and spiritual teacher, to discuss the Shashti Porthi lecture seminars. My name is Rob Meager. I'm an interfaith minister, and I lead a spiritual ministry initiative in Ottawa, Canada called Spiritual Guidance. I'm a student of Richard Harvey's work since 2012. Today's interview will discuss the Shashti Porthi Lecture Seminars as a whole. This seminar series is an eight-part lecture series, and each subsequent interview in this series will explore in more detail each one of the lectures in the Shashti Porthi Lecture Seminars. The manuscripts for all of the seminars are contained in an ebook entitled Dharma Sky which is available through the Sacred Attention Therapy website at www.sacredattentiontherapy.com forward slash book. Dharma Sky is one of a trilogy of three ebooks, each containing 14 lectures, totaling 42 lectures. The second ebook is entitled Bhok Shadong, and the third ebook is entitled Bodhi Ocean and is currently in production. Again, all ebooks are available through the Sacred Attention Therapy website at www.sacredattentiontherapy.com forward slash books. You can also listen to the full recording of each of the lectures in this series online, again through the Sacred Attention Therapy website at www.sacredattentiontherapy.com forward slash education. And now I'd like to provide you with some background about Richard Harvey. Richard Harvey is a psychospiritual psychotherapist, author, and spiritual teacher. His career spans 37 years working with individuals, couples, groups, and communities. He trained in humanistic and transpersonal psychologies and psychotherapy, studied meditation in India, and trained in Zoto Zen. He has been influenced by Jung, Rudyu, Alan Watts, and Joseph Campbell, the ancient Taoists and the Vedas, predominantly Advaita Vedanta. He has a particular affinity with Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, and Ramana Maharshi, and was more recently inspired by Adiga Samraj and Nisargadatta. Deeper than all these varied experiences and teachings, however, is the early truth Richard possessed since childhood, a deep understanding and intimacy with the Numina, the divine source of being. It is from this innate wisdom that his spiritual teaching has blossomed, grown, and developed. Richard is a prolific, passionate writer of author. Two of his books were self-published efforts, The Book of Being in 1998 and Tao's Gift in 2005. The Flight of Consciousness was published by Ashgrove Publishing in 2002, and his latest book, Your Essential Self, the Inner Journey to Authenticity and Spiritual Enlightenment was published by Llewellyn Worldwide Limited in 2013. Richard has published nearly 200 articles, and he is currently working on his forthcoming book entitled Your Sacred Calling. Richard's lifetime of study, work, and experience has culminated in his independent psychospiritual psychotherapy practice from his mountaintop spiritual center, Cortillo Lano de Nantarno, a center that's set in the beautiful and tranquil three acres on the southern slopes of the Sierra Nevada mountain in Andalusia, Spain. From his center, Richard offers individual therapy and couples counseling in person or via Skype to people all over the world, spiritual and psycho-spiritual training and supervision, as well as courses and retreats. 
Richard Harvey's work connects personality and spirituality through a middle stage of heart awakening, authenticity, and compassion in his comprehensive model of human development, the three stages of awakening. He is the founder of sacred attention therapy, a profound, radical, and fresh approach to sacred spiritual life and to the dilemmas which have arisen from the accelerated development of ego processes in the 21st century. He believes that it is through the transformation of the individual in his unique struggle to become fully him or herself that we will progress through a collective gestation of soul and spirit into a timely light and expanded consciousness. And it's now my pleasure to welcome and invite Richard Harvey to the call. Welcome, Richard. Hi, Robert. Good to be with you. You too. And we're here today as an introduction to the Shashti Porthi Lecture Seminars uh, to talk about the, the lecture series as a whole. And to begin, some of the words you use in the titles of your lecture seminars may not be commonplace to everyone. Uh, Shasti Porthi may not be a common term for everyone. What do those words you mean? And where did you receive the inspiration for the title of the series? Shashri Porthi comes from the Japanese and it is a ritual or a rite of passage um, at age 60 that denotes the second half of life. And I guess um, there's more to it in a way because one of the themes uh, that I speak about is the atrophying or the or almost the disappearance now of the sacred spiritual rituals and ceremonies and rites of passage in life. Therefore, what I do is I look around wherever I can find um, viable rites of passage or ceremony denoting um, stages of maturity, stages in life. And when I was preparing the Sashti Porthi lectures, I was um, beginning them, I think, in or around my 60th birthday. It felt significant and it felt as if... Um, Regrettably, in the West, there isn't a particular deep understanding of these stages of maturity. Therefore, we, or at least I, uh, reach out and just shamelessly um, take from wherever we can find um, a viable tradition that's still in place. And it turned out in Japan, in other uh, countries in Asia too, I was drawn to the description of the ceremony, I was drawn to the words, and it seemed to say something that meant something to me at the time. So these lectures, although I had done others uh, online, and certainly others um, in person, uh, these new lectures, which felt like a new beginning, came on the crest of a wave which coincided or perhaps was inspired by hitting uh, 60. Mm -hmm. Sashri Purthi just spoke to me. I encourage anyone who's, um, who's embracing middle life and moving towards 60 to look into the Asian traditions, not because you know, they should be in the East exclusively or they should be um, you know, in other countries or other continents, but because we can learn something, maybe we can bring it back. And without the cultural inflections, which, you know, there's colors and clothing that's involved in this ceremony, for example, which wouldn't have the mm -hmm. same uh, significance to us in the West. Um, but mm -hmm. I think what we could do, what we should do to mark the uh, transitions through life is to mark mm -hmm. with a ceremony um, the important psychobiological stages of life. And this is certainly one. Uh, for me, as it is for anybody entering the 60s, likewise the 50s and so on. We know that intuitively. Mm -hmm. The other, not all the time have I used uh, Asian words in the titles for the series, but the, the following one was, and it was the Panchavati 
um, series yeah. of, of talks. Yeah. And that had a different kind of meaning to me. I mean, it was intensely personal. On my 60th mm -hmm. birthday, I'd received the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, which is a, a, just a wonderful book. And you may remember, Robert, I'm referring to it on and off because it's kind of a, obsessive for me in those periods when yeah. I was writing those talks. And uh, the Panchavati was this, and there's photographs of this today, that the trees are still there, um, was this wonderful um, glade, I guess, you know, where these incredible trees, just amazing trees, uh, were planted mm. by Sri Ramakrishna himself and where he went to mm. enter Samadhi. And, you know, if people listening ever get around to reading the book, the various episodes in his spiritual, um, in the evolution of his spiritual life occur in the Panchavati. It's just this wonderful place. So it, it came to mean something to me. Mm -hmm. And um, it felt very appropriate to call the second series the Panchavati mm -hmm. series. But, uh, and we'll be, we'll be talking about those in, in great depth as this this interview series goes on. But you spoke about um, the title of the lecture series speaking to this rite of passage, and you spoke about where your inspiration came from, in part, or perhaps predominantly, or even solely, that significant rite of passage you felt, you know, turning that milestone of 60. And I'm still immersing myself in your writing and your teachings. Um, you talk a lot about the psycho-spiritual development that a person goes through in stages. Um, and, and you've talked a lot with me about the seven-year cycles. Um, so one through seven, eight through 13, so on and so forth. Um, and that, that just keeps going. But what is it about this middle time that we find ourselves in. And by middle time, I'm going to very generally um, uh, peg it as mid-40s to late 50s. And it seems to be this time in so many people's lives when they hit a wall or um, some transformative experience happens, this middle time that so often propels people into the spiritual realm. What is it, or to explore either the spiritual realm or to take a dedicated, serious, um, honest look at themselves? What is it about this middle time that often launches people into inner work? Something quite definitely kicks in on or around uh, the 42nd uh, year. It, th there's no question about this in, in my own practice, and it's been going on for too long, and I've seen it too often to think otherwise. I believe that what happens uh, in the late 30s is there is a re-evaluation that usually revol results in a, a restlessness and a dissatisfaction and a re-evaluation of everything in a person's life. Now, whether they then um, rest in the trajectories that they're currently mm -hmm. in because they have family and commitments and so on, or whether they are you know, free enough or able enough or courageous enough to uh, change things, that's up to the individual life. But invariably, as I've said many times, if we were to do a graph, in my own practice over nearly 40 years, and I know that of many other people, it would peak um, around 37, 38. Really quite precise. So th what this means is you're going to see a lot more people coming into therapy uh, who want to do inner work, who can't see the outside in terms of satisfaction and fulfillment in the way they used to. And then they turn, if they have the tendency, to some form of inner work. Now, that could be a dark form of inner work, or it could be something bright. I mean, to my mind, inner work and therapy, meditation, so on, are, are bright ways. It could be a um, despair. It could be disillusionment with life. You could settle into... Mm. 
uh, I don't know, you know drugs, uh, alcoholism. Um, it is, of course, famously around uh, 40, early 40s, the so-called midlife crisis. But then that's possibly got a mm-hmm. shelf life of about 12 years or so anyway. Um, it's a loose term. But it certainly kicks in there because it's looking outside for something which won't be appeased, the appetite won't be fed by anything on the outside, I believe a psychobiological urge kicks in. It more or less says, it will, if it were to have a voice, reevaluate everything in your life. Look at it all again. How come I'm not happy? Mm-hmm. Maybe I was happy with certain things, like I was when I was a child, certain things made me happy and now I'm in my 30s and there's a certain movement into achievement and ambition is no longer cutting the mustard you know and something new's got to happen so so often we see people in the late 30s coming to meditation to workshops to uh, some kind of inner exploration and I believe this is an anticipation of the early 40s when um, it becomes increasingly absurd to live within the emotional, behavioral patterns and character strategies that were sourced or created in early life in the seminal years. It's just absurd. You're, you're going to wind up being 50 and still being a child. And mm-hmm. I believe that instinctively we know this isn't all right. It doesn't suit us. And not only that, we're missing out because there's there's wonders to embrace in the subsequent stages of life which you'll miss if you have this baggage with you you when you get to 50 more or less I think there's a tipping I think we know this as well I don't think we have to be people who read or read psychology or you know religion spirituality or have to be involved within a work I think we all kind of feel there's a movement around the middle late 40s maybe early 50s where it's as if the scales tip and we've come from a place which is orientated to life it's coming from birth and early life and possibility and potential and all of this you know grand vision you know I want to do this I want to do this with my life something tips Mm -hmm. at some point and we're orientated toward death Now, depending Mm. on your state of enlightenment at that point, or I don't mean spiritual enlightenment, but your your state of understanding and your openness to these ideas, that's a good thing or it's a bad thing. It can be a a dark thing or it can be a bright thing. You know, you welcome, some Mm -hmm. of us welcome, you know, the, the later years, the years of wisdom, the years in which we embrace being an elder. The culture doesn't seem to recognize this very much, but you know, we individually maybe get the hang of it and hopefully it will change over time. Mm-hmm. But uh, when this tip happens, traditionally, at least in Asia, and it should be in the West, we turn towards the inner things. We turn towards the sacred objects. We turn away from the world. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean we give up you know, our family and our job and our house and wander off with a begging bowl. You would do that perhaps in India in a traditional um, life. But you can feel the appropriateness of that turning in that turning in toward the forest, turning in towards um, seeing the face of God, as it's traditionally known. And you turn towards something which is now going to be as much use to you in the subsequent decades or years, or maybe it's not very long, who knows, orientated towards Mm -hmm. death, old age perhaps, and death, in the same way as you embraced the tools and what was necessary in the early seminal years when you were looking toward life you constructed a personality and a mm-hmm. character and an ego force and you mediated between you know shoulds and wants and all these kind of you know all this went on very rapidly in mm-hmm. about five years mm-hmm. and the thing was calcified within six or seven years it's enormously rapid And then you appeared um, as an ever-evolving individual self. And one of these tippings Mm -hmm. towards death is that that um, refuge, the refuge that you took in the creation of the individual self at the beginning of life, no longer serves. How can it? 
you know, you're heading towards death. Yeah. If you want to survive, you've hopefully or possibly been through that in terms of anything you want to bequeath, but you yourself, as an individual, um, ego, mm. egoic uh, person, are looking at your demise. Mm. And so mm -hmm. something else mm -hmm. has got to happen. So the invitation really is to enter the mystery. <laughs> now, I wanted to take the opportunity in talking about that mystery in the context of the Shashti Porphy Lecture Seminars. There's four seminar titles, each in two parts, which is why there's eight parts to the Shashti Porphy Lecture Seminars. But the four seminar titles are Absolute Freedom, Honoring the Gate, Sacred Attention, and the three stages of awakening. Again, each seminar is offered in two parts, part one and part two. Why did you choose those four titles? Again, I'll repeat them, absolute freedom, honoring the gate, sacred attention, and the three stages of awakening. Where did those four titles come from as part of the series? Just a short preamble so that, um, to place it in context really, um, when recently or over the last two years sometimes people write things to me or they might write a passage from one of the talks or something from one of the um, articles uh, that I've written or even from one of the books, um, many times I've read it and I, and I thought, you know that's good. You know I like I like that. And then I've realised it was something that I'd written, and they're commenting on it and something like that. I don't. I'm not saying this to, um, you know, self-aggrandise myself. But I tend to look at these things. I go, well, that, that, that's pretty good. I I, I agree. <laughs> and um, the reality is, once I've written it or um, produced it, it's uh, it's gone. The other reality is, I don't think very much. It, it, it's not a matter of thought. It's a matter really of, um, my metaphor at the moment for spiritual teaching is join me at the window. It is one of the ways I've been talking about, it. you know, you join me at the window or you join somebody else at the window. You know, we look, we have a window, we're looking through. We're looking at an ocean or the sky mm -hmm. or the landscape, you know, but we're looking and we're looking at truth. That's what that metaphor is about. We have a window mm -hmm. on truth, or as it's been called sometimes before, uh, the spiritual teacher is a hole. He creates a hole in the veil of illusion, shall we say. So for me, over mm -hmm. these last 10, 12 years, this veil of illusion has separated into a hole, and one of the conditions, seemingly, of um, the function of spiritual teaching is don't think. You know, if you think about it, you're interpreting, you're analyzing, it goes through a logical filter, shall we say. When, therefore, to get more directly to your question, um, the impulse to create talks on important topics to do with psychospirituality, mm -hmm. when this arose in me, I as much as I remember is I remember thinking well it's about freedom and then I remember thinking something like actually it's about absolute freedom and then a logical part of me said something that well you can't really have absolute freedom I mean you know what are you talking about and I thought well that's really what this is about then so the first two lectures in the Sashti Porthi series are about something which is impossible or possible or how can we understand it you see how can we understand absolute freedom and it was just there so I didn't sit down and say well you know absolute mm -hmm. freedom and, and and make it up um, it comes and it's the same with the writing I don't structure the writing I don't structure my books and this it, it, it's hugely um, um, difficult that because you most certainly should structure large pieces of writing but I don't I can't it just doesn't happen like that um, it's just not logical um, what, what I'm writing about so all I remember is thinking 
So I had no idea this would be a 42 lecture series. I just thought maybe this is a bunch of talks and mm. that's that. And the feeling was this impulse should embrace the big things. So we had freedom. We have honoring the gate because, you know, the gate is so important because your capacity and your potential, even your destiny are inherent in your, the way in which you come in. I mean, that's a long talk, and I probably covered this in some way in the talks, but you remember? I'm interested to, to what, Richard? You've mentioned in, in the context of honoring the gate, come, come into, into the inner realms, come into, come into your uh, inner practice in a serious way. It means if you were a dilettante, you're now serious. That's your entrance. And if maybe you never t thought about it before, and then it grabs you. Well, that's your entrance. You, you know, it's different for different people. It doesn't mean you're in therapy or you have a guru, or you're involved in meditation or a practice, and then necessarily you're at the gate. The gate may appear after some time. It may appear before you find the practice. It's, we've got to just open up about this. You know, the gate is the gate, and you know what it is for you. And it may even have uh, layers. You know, there may be gates. I think we probably talked about that too. Um, so this seemed like a big thing. We should certainly talk about that in two parts. And the other two are sacred attention, which has become, at that point, as I recall, I hadn't adopted it as a name for my um, psychotherapy approach. Um, so it's pre that, but it, it resonated with me from then. And it just kept coming mm -hmm. back and eventually, mm -hmm. um, although I'm loath to label, I thought it seems to be we can call my work sacred attention therapy. You know? And the third one is uh, three stages of awakening. And three stages of awakening are also not a logical thought and neither are they a theory. You know, they are simply an observation. Again, it's like joining one at the window. This, um, this is what I see. And this is what, when, just a few years ago, I asked myself a question which seemed to be an important question. How is personality connected to spirituality? I mean, what's the connective tissue here? You know, how does it work? Um, three stages of awakening was, was my answer. So that's the fourth uh, pair of lectures. But the thing I want to just emphasize is it's not thought out. But these at the time seem to be the big, the big ones, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, in sharing why you chose those titles and in talking a little bit about each of them, um, uh, <laughs> is something that I'm, um, I marvel at because I tend to be a very structured person. Approach things, do first one, then do two. You don't do three until one and two are done, and so on and so forth. And you shared numerous times in talking about um, why those titles, that um, there's really no structure. And what I felt and heard coming through, in part, and you didn't use these words, I'm offering these words, but there's an aspect of divine intervention that comes into play in these lectures. Does it feel that way to you? Does it, does it feel like you're being led or guided in some form to write about and to share these teachings? Yeah. It does. The experience is um, of emptying. The experience is of emptying, and it is um, very like a teaching I happened on in um, India. Other people know it, I'm sure, which is you become as the hollow bamboo. You allow yourself to be played. Um, not only is that immensely pleasurable and, in a sense, easy, but it's also... Um, profoundly satisfying really I mean it seems to me to be what um, mm -hmm. what we're for or at least it seems mm -hmm. to be you know what I'm for I know I could write mm -hmm. some 
stuff. I mean, you know, I've written things before here and there um, that are not perhaps, um, you know, divinely blessed so much as, you, you know, written by Richard Harvey, but it's by no means as uh, interesting when I look back. And I'm certainly very identified mm-hmm. with it. It's very personal, shall we say. Um, I used, as you know, in the lectures many times, uh, personal anecdotes, but this really came from the influence of the books that I've written where I had presented very little anecdotes, actually, in both. I mean, none in my first book and very few in my second book. And in both cases, um, there was a lot of pressure to write stories, write personal stories, so people could engage. And I know I've talked before, I think, on in the seminar part of one of the recent lectures about this, but um, in a way, reluctantly, I did. You know, because, you know, one of my teachers, not in the body now, is Nisargadatta, and Nisargadatta famously um, presented very little biological, uh, um, very little biographical um, information. And I think that's right. I think that's absolutely right. And of course, everybody wanted, and everybody now wants, and now posthumously as his uh, fame and enlightenment spreads, the knowledge of Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj, everyone wants to know about him because you want, I don't know, something up on Wikipedia and something in the beginning of the book, and people are tremendously interested. But of course, what we need to remember is it's, it's egocentric the whole idea of the great interest of somebody being in their personality and their dealings and their wayfaring through life or something, the individual things are not by any means as important as the wisdom that alights on one or dawns inside one over time. And even happens when you're young sometimes, and you know it when you're young, and you certainly know it when you're old as well. So the... The interesting thing about the lectures really, to me, is the wisdom that's inherent in them. The clarity of spirituality is what I love. On a personal level, I embrace them as a listener. When I'm uh, speaking, I'm listening. And when I read them again, I'm uh, Mm -hmm. listening. And that's what I love about them, is the the brightness Mm -hmm. and the truth. And this particular... Um, inflection somehow it seems to me is the the clarity um, because so often and I've never been drawn to it spirituality is spoken of in a kind of mushy way or a way that doesn't uh, isn't as bright as I intuited it somehow was or could be shall we say so the view from my window is bright mm-hmm. When I've read the lectures several times, each of them, and I'm left with um, the feeling, and per- perhaps I'm not perceiving this accurately, or as was intended, but absolute freedom, honoring the gate, and the three stages of awakening appear to me to be oriented to the seeker. Whereas I found sacred attention feels more oriented towards the practitioner. Um, that's what I felt anyway, reading the, the whole series, listening to first, and then having the pleasure of rereading the manuscripts. Was that intentional? That is, absolute freedom, honor, and gate in the three stages of awakening were more oriented towards the seeker whereas sacred attention was oriented towards the practitioner. Do do you see it that way? Do you feel it that way? I don't remember that that intention, intention, Robert. I don't remember it. Um, And I think I would have to scour it again um, to be able to reflect back on that. Um, I do know that in my Mm -hmm. writing and speaking that very often the practitioner um, perspective is merged in many ways with the uh, seeker perspective. I don't know if it's 
a strength really or a weakness i mean i do know in you know my latest book your essential self which when i presented it in you know, many thousands of words and i had to cut out at least half one of the things that emerged was there was a big section which was really talking to the practitioner really and and when i realized that it became quite mm -hmm. easy to kind of take that out i i saw that in a way this was could be confusing and so i poured it out and it wasn't enough i had to take out a lot more but um I was a bit surprised how I had merged the seeker perspective into the teacher perspective or the practitioner or the, the therapist, the healer perspective and then through. But that is because they don't look so very different to me. And that is because perhaps in my mm -hmm. own life it's been rather merged. It's never been um, particularly distinct. And I, I, I appreciate what you're sharing because I too, with most of your lectures, feel it could be seen from either chair, if I can say it that way. This one in particular, though, jumped out at me as being more oriented. That is, um, the sacred attention. It, it just felt more oriented towards the practitioner because of the the offerings in the lecture about mm. how to be with someone, how to cultivate that attention, that sacred attention, how to cultivate that space within yourself to create a space for... But you know, one of the things therapy. that happens in inner work, for doesn't it, is, is that um, in amongst the subpersonalities there, over time, something which is modelled for you with a guide or a teacher or a therapist, a counsellor or, or whoever, and is objectively another person, full of your projections, of course, and transferences, of course, mm -hmm. who is before you and with whom you then grapple mm -hmm. with your personal material and in time perhaps your, perhaps your spiritual material as well, over time comes internalized and it's a it's a way in western psychology or psychology human psychology of describing something that's said very well in Sota Zen which is we meditate in the Zendo until the Zendo is in us and what happens there is um, in a very structured um, progression the um, you know the the junior monk uh, begins uh, his meditation everything is meditation you know the work is meditation sitting at the dining table is meditation um, uh, in the bathroom is meditation there's prayers for all of this and you uh, and then the whole day is punctuated with zazen and sitting on the um, sitting on the zephyr and looking at the wall you know eventually it all becomes a blur of meditation you know, whatever you're doing or not doing that's not the point you're, you're just aware you're in zazen you're sitting even when you're physically or literally walking running or hurrying you're sitting you see inside you and so what happens in in time is that sitting becomes the the space around you is taken in you absorb it it comes in and that center and that stillness and that quiet meditative heart of course was always yours it's just you saw it out there in the search and so in a similar way this is about the merging of the seeker and the teacher counselor guide therapist um, after a while teacher is in internalized and I remember in my own practice that I would very much modeled on my first therapist you know and his ways of conducting workshops and at the beginning of my workshops I would um, I'd, I'd talk to his voice I talked to him as if he were inside me I mean I would actually but he was external in a sense you know it's almost like I'd put a cushion there or something and I'd say well you know I'm, I'm terrified you know what do I have to do now and he'd something would come you know I have two or three exchanges and then I'd feel whatever and then I'd start the thing you know I'd be the group leader or something but after two or three years perhaps or more or less I don't know I didn't do that anymore 
it was in me. It wasn't an outward form. It wasn't even projected in the inside. So it had been modelled out there and now it came in. And I think that's the a way of relating to our inner wisdom in a culture where inner wisdom isn't uh, cultivated or seen as um, a reality you know, for children. You know, you know, I don't know about you. Well, I do know a little about you and I know about myself and people I talk to. How often do you meet anybody who says, you know, I was brought up in a family and I went to a school where um, they brought out my inner wisdom and they talked to me about my childhood sensitivity and spent lots of time and attention on my uh, inner objects and dynamics. It just doesn't happen. But when, but if you go back there, what we find is there it is. You know, we knew how to regulate ourselves. We knew how to cultivate wisdom. We were, in a sense, already wise. And then you've projected it for a number of years, and then you know the gate has opened for you, and you take it back. Yeah. And I'll I'll use that as our foyer if I can, into bringing this initial interview to a close, because we're out of time for today. Um, but again, uh, thank you for introducing us to the Shashti Porthi Lecture Seminars. And the subsequent eight interviews will take each one of the uh, seminars, Absolute Freedom, Honoring the Gate, Sacred Attention, the Three Stages of Awakening, in two parts, each in two parts, and we'll look at each of the two parts of each of the four for a total of eight uh, in more Thank detail. You, and I look forward to it, Richard. Thank you. For now.